still alive inside of me 20 something years later 26 years later I, I just want to see the earth and see that spirit of revival touch whole regions and so we got into that we got into prayer we we did we 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 came through here we have three daughters 24 21 13 turning 14 here in a couple of months and and then the Lord began to talk to us about a son and we named him Josiah Nash Russell after an intercessor, who's ever heard of Charles Finney before? All right, if you don't, I'm going to give you a little history lesson on revival. There's been two great awakenings in America. I'm talking about to where the spirit of conviction has swept cities, states, regions, and to where the preaching of the Word of God cut like a hammer, and hundreds of thousands of souls were swept into the kingdom. The second great awakening was in the early 1800s, and God used Charles Finney in upstate New York in such a powerful way. Well, there was this man by the name of Daniel Nash who would forerun Charles Finney's revival campaigns, and for about two to three weeks ahead of time, he would labor in intercession so that when Finney came to town, when he preached, the Word of God would go forth in power. Well, Finney goes, I never knew his I never needed his preaching or his theology. I needed his praying. And he said Finney, uh, Nash would always walk in on the first night of a revival, and he would say simply, the Lord has come. And Finney goes, I never knew a time. He was wrong. Well, me and Dana got wrecked over this intercessor. He was a hidden intercessor. Nobody knew about him. His gravestone in upstate New York says, Daniel Nash, co-laborer with Finney, mighty in prayer. And so we named our son Josiah Nash. And on March 16, 2013, I was in London, England ministering. She brought the kids down to see family in Mountainburg, laid him down for a nap. He didn't wake up, and we were thrown into the dark night, the tragedy of tragedies. And uh, we, it was very difficult years, but yet a cry on the inside of me began to arise. God, I pray that you would take this place of tragedy and turn it into an inheritance. Now, I believe in that John 12, unless a seed goes into the ground and dies. God uses seeds and death and resurrection to bring forth his purposes. And I'm like, God, bring something out of this. And I was really locked in on Psalm 2. And Psalm 2, it, it, and I'm not going to preach it all tonight because i got like 10 messages in me. So I'm just going to scream them all to you. And I think they said that we got to close at 6 in the morning. So I've got plenty of time. Oh, Paul was preaching, and that kid was sitting in that window, and he fell out because he fell asleep. <laughs> Paul went and raised him from the dead. Um, oh, Eutychus. Um, <laughs> and so um, I really began in, in 2015. I was crying out, Psalm 2 is when the devil wages the greatest warfare over Jesus' inheritance. The rage, chaos, confusion... David's saying, why do the nations rage? Why do the peoples plot a vain thing? And they're waging war against the Lord and against his anointed. Well, the father's laughing, saying, none of you kings are going to get this. This is my king and my hill. And then in Psalm 2, verse 7, he said this. He said, I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me, you are my son, ask of me, and I will give you the nations as your inheritance. Everybody say inheritance. That word possessed my life. And I began to see it because the Father's telling Jesus in Psalm 2, you see those nations raging? Ask me for them. I'm going to make them your inheritance. The Lord told me in that season, he goes, Corey, your greatest places of warfare are to become your greatest places of inheritance. And I began to cry out for inheritance. I began to cry out for inheritance. God, of course, I wanted to stay married, okay? Marriages that survive at the loss of a child are very small. I'm like, God, I just want to stay married and get old with this woman. I want to have godly kids and grandkids. That's what we want for inheritance. And yet in that season, the Lord even began to broaden my understanding of inheritance. Because in that season, I had a prophetic friend that had a dream. And in the dream, the cultural wars, the, all the culture and, and its chaos was increasing and we were like in medieval times, and everyone ran to the city square realizing we don't know how to pray in these days. 
Well, I come into the dream smiling, saying, these are the days we've been waiting on. And my friend began to prophesy over me. And he said, Corey, for every one voice of awakening, I'm going to raise up seven voices of intercession. I said it again. For every one voice of awakening, I'm going to raise up seven voices of intercession. And he said, I've given Lou Engle, many of you may or may not know that name, I've given him the Nazarites. He goes, but I'm giving you the Nazarites. And the Nazarites will be an army of intercessors. They may not be known in the eyes of men, but they're going to be famous in heaven. And I'm going to hear their prayers and send revival to their homes, revival to their churches, and revival to their cities. When I got that word, I said, Lord, give me 100 million Nazarites. Give me 100 million Nazarites. I, God, you're the good accountant. I'll let you do the numbers. But I'm going to preach this and disciple this till I die to awaken a generation of intercessors. And I, amen. And so when we talk about inheritance specifically, I'm preaching this all over the globe. But at the end of the day, what's burning inside of me and Dana is that at the very land that we got born again, the very land where our son passed away, that very Crawford County would come underneath such a spirit of glory, such a spirit of revival, and that God would shake the river valley and fill this region with his, with his spirit. We want it all over the world, but I specifically want it here. So it's not casual, it's not another message, it's a specific message, and it's sowed into this ground. And I've been carrying it, and it's been hard. It's kind of like that whole Nazareth thing with Jesus. And, any, and you know, and you know, he wasn't accepted. And, I, and yet, it, I feel like we're moving into that time of dreams and inheritance of the preparation of the ground. I'm looking for young people that begin to get a vision on the inside of them that God hears your prayers. And that God will send the outpouring of the Spirit and shake our Van Buren High and Alma High and Mount Berg High and Mulberry and shake this region with His presence. We just need a couple of you to get a vis vision bigger than what's for lunch. We, it just, we just need a couple of you that get a vision bigger than what's for lunch. Or I can't, we're going to church on Sunday. Of course you go to church on Sunday. But what does Monday through Saturday look like? Has a burden laid hold of your life? Have you caught a vision for what could happen if God began to move and God began to strike a fire in the heart of his people? I believe in that. I believe God hears prayer. I believe God moves at the sound of our prayers. I don't care what the statistics are. I don't care what the rates are. I believe in the power of prayer. And I believe God is coming into this region and he's turning our hearts. He's turning our hearts. So this is about inheritance. It's about a spirit of revival. It's about a spirit of prayer. This is where I learned how to pray. That God would begin to awaken prayer in this region. I keep feeling, and I'm just going to just kind of, I got a prophetic ministry, but it's Bible verses. You know, I, I, if I stood up everybody in this room and said, the Lord would say to you, da, 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 you go, oh, that's amazing. It just changed my life. But if I tell you to turn to John 4, you're like, okay, is that all we got? Why don't you tell me something a little deeper? I ain't got anything more deeper than telling you that I feel like Crawford County is Samaria. And it blows me away that Jesus, because he's tired and because he can't find worship in Jerusalem, he's going to go up to a place where Jews had no dealings with up in Samaria, and Jesus is going to find himself at a well that's thirsty. And I can feel Jesus' thirst. Do you know Jesus gets thirsty? No, no, no. Do you know Jesus gets thirsty? And he's not just thirsty for water, he's thirsty for worship. Because we worship men in pulpits, we worship men on stages, we worship everybody but Jesus, and I can feel the desire 
and the thirst inside of Jesus for worship, and this is who he goes to. He goes to the -the out-of-the-way places and the most disqualified of people and makes them in the, the picture of worship in spirit and in truth. Jesus comes up to Samaria. Jews would always go around Samaria, but Jesus, it says this in John 4, needed to go through Samaria. He needed to because he was underneath the Father's leadership. And he's sitting by a well, Jacob's well, and and he's waiting at a specific time. It's about noontime when he knows that the women of ill repute are going to be coming to draw their water. He waits specifically, the, 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 the married women are going to come earlier in the day, and it's in the heat of the day where there's a woman that comes, and Jesus is going to look at her, doesn't let her off the hook. Give me a drink. And she goes, why, why are you asking me? Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus says, if you knew who I am and what I got, you would have asked me, and I would have given you living water. What he's saying is I'm not looking for physical water. I'm looking for your worship. I'm looking for a drink from you. And when I said give me a drink, I was hoping you would say give me a drink so I can give you a drink. I want you to know Jesus is thirsty for worship in Crawford County. I'm talking about pure worship. I'm talking about extended worship. I'm talking about worship that's more than a melody, more than a chorus, more than a nice song, but is a life that is absolutely lost in the beauty of Jesus and that wants to love him and worship him with everything they have. Jews have no dealings. He goes, She goes, where do you get this water? They go through this long talk where he's talking about spiritual water. Where do you get this water? He goes, get, she goes, give me this water that I don't have to come here and draw. And Jesus awakened her spiritual thirst and says, now we got to deal with truth. He said, go call your husband. we got to deal with your broken sister and you keep running to. we gotta, we got to deal with all of the men that you keep running to to fill this God-shaped vacuum that no man is going to be able to touch. Isn't it amazing that it's going to be the seventh man that's going to quench her thirst? Because she's been thirsty. And she's ran after every man in Samaria and could not get that thirst quenched. And here she is with the seventh man and he goes, go call your husband. Well, she's feeling good. She just broke, she just divorced her sixth, living, shacking up with a dude. She's feeling good. I'm not married. Jesus goes, you're right. <laughs> You've had six husbands and the man that you're living with now, or five husbands, and the man that you're living with now is not your husband. She goes, I perceive you're a prophet. <laughs> it's one of my favorite lines in the Bible. She's trying to get all deep. I got got a little discernment on me. There's something on your life. You got a prophetic spirit on you. I perceive you're a prophet. They tell us that only in Jerusalem can we worship. And Jesus says, honey, I want you to know that it's not in Jerusalem or this place or that place, but I want you to know that it's in every place and that my Father is seeking those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. I feel a worship anointing that God wants to uncap worship in this region. Freshness. That's what marked this move of God was we would sing about the river for hours. We would sing about jump in the river and get touched by the river of God in the Ezekiel 47 river where it goes from your ankles to your knees to your waist. There is a river. There's an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that quenches your thirst and delivers you from one more binge watch of a Netflix show. That delivers you from one more documentary you need to watch. But that frees your heart to get lost in Him. I love it. She dropped her water pot. She ran back in the city. Now this is the second part. And this is what the anointing is on your life, Kevin. 
You got worship, and then you got this woman, drops her water pot, and she runs back into the city, I love this, and preaches to the men, listen, about a man. Come see a man that's told me everything I ever did. Who is like Jesus to take the most disqualified evangelist in the city, to take the most ill repute woman in the city, quench her thirst, receive her worship, and then send her as an evangelist to the men about a man? The very places he's taken you out of, he's going to send you back into. And he's going to use you, and it's not going to be come to my church, it's come see a man. It's not come to my church, it's come see a man. There's something higher than just your church. Go to church. But it's about a man. It's about a beautiful man who is fully God. And through him, all things were made. And without him, nothing was made that was made. He is the beginning. He is the first. He is the last. He's the alpha. He's the omega. He's the bright and the morning star. He's the bridegroom. He's the word. He's the living bread, the living drink. He's the creator of the universe. What's his name? His name is Jesus. Jesus. And that man's name is going to get on our lips again. It's going to break out into our workplaces. It's going to break out into our schools. Jesus. Jesus. We're going to fall in love with him again. That's really what revival is all about. It's a resurrection. It's a resurrection of something that was dead. It was a reviving of something that's been lost. And I get it, guys. I feel like, and it's not just here. All my friends, the last decade's been an intense decade. Things are ratcheting up. Things are intensifying. The dark's getting darker and the light's getting lighter. I think there's a generation coming out of the closet that's going to push the church back into the closet so we can reconnect with him who's in the closet so we can get our voice back. It's going to take pressure to get us out of the games. It's actually going to take cultural pressure Versus us just sitting in coffee shops and barbershops going, well, we're all going to hell. It's all getting horrible. That is not the church's response. We're not some victim mentality. It's all going down. The question is, is the church going to come out of complacency and apathy and lethargy and hypocrisy and actually get on fire again? Because Jesus is not coming back for a bored bride. He's not coming back for an ugly bride. He's not coming back for a divided bride. He's not coming back for an immature bride. He's not coming back for an adulterous bride. He's going to come back for a bride who wants him, who loves him, who's joined to him. I'm not trying to get an amen. I'm just saying amen. I'm amen in myself. That's good, Corey. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. Thank you. Uh, everybody say resurrection. Let's go. That's revival. It was in Crawford County where I caught a vision for revival. in Crawford County where I saw God do it. I love, this is my favorite thing to do. We come here for Thanksgiving every year, and I'll get up usually about 6 a.m. on Thanksgiving morning, drive over to Fort Smith, or Van Buren now, thank God for the Starbucks over here. <laughs> and you guys changed our world from like Mountainburg. I'm like, where in the world am I going to go? <laughs> Father-in-law's Folgers ain't working. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, because yeah, I'm so bougie. <laughs> And I drive around, and this is what I love to do. I love to get off of 64 and say, yep, that's where I had my 
my uh, second DWI. I love to drive into Alma and say, yep, there was my first DWI. Yeah, I got high over here. This happened over here. And then I love to drive to the church and drive on there and saying, that's when God laid hold of my life. And that's when God began to lay hold of me and I encountered the presence of God. And everything changed. Everything changed. I love to do that every year. And I take my kids on it. They've seen the same thing ten times. I said, we're going again. <laughs> we're going again. They've seen it all. I said, I'll get you a coffee. What, whatever you want. I love it. Get to see Brandon right back here. He, he evangelized me when I was at West Stark, high as a kite. He came up to me talking to me about Jesus. I got so much history in this place. See, this is what I feel like's happened, though, and I want to encourage you guys tonight because some of you, I do believe in resurrection. But some of you, you might feel like Mary and Martha when their brother Lazarus had gone through a dark night and Jesus didn't get there on time and you're thrown into a dark night. Y'all know what I'm talking about in John 11. I don't, I don't like wasting time of telling you, turn your Bibles. I'm just going to quote it to you. John 11. It says that in the town of Mary and Martha, there was Lazarus of Bethany. And he was getting sick. And they sent a letter to Jesus saying, behold, he whom you love is sick. It says that when Jesus, it says Jesus loved Martha and Mary and Lazarus. And he says, he said it. They send this letter to Jesus saying, hey, your boy's getting sick. He's not in good shape. We need you. Okay? They send the letter to him. Jesus gets the letter and releases one of the greatest, most faith-filled statements in Scripture. He said, this sickness is not unto death, but it's for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. I mean, when Jesus makes a statement like that, you get your seatbelt on, it's about to be explosive. Jesus is releasing emphatic. God's getting glory through this. Hallelujah. And it says he loved them. I don't know why John needed to tell us that. I think. So you would think that the natural next verse after he loved them would be, he translated to Bethany, Laid his hands on Lazarus. He got up and they had a dance party. That's what he, y'all remember Matthew 8 and the Roman centurion? Hey, my servant is at home. He's in bad shape. Jesus goes, let's go. He's ready. Sinners, Jesus, bang. Strangers, bang. This guy, bang. That girl, bang. He spoke words. He stretched his hand. Whoever touched him, he's just a walking healing show. And here he's got somebody he loves. Here's somebody he actually likes. Somebody that he's got history with. He sat in their house for hours. And he had a real deep intimacy with this family. And it says, now Jesus loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. So you would think the next verse is he fixed it quickly. But it says that he stayed two more days where he was at. What happens when you know Jesus has heard your prayer for the failing marriage or the child or the financial situation or the circumstance where you have cried out to God from the depths of your heart and you know he's heard you? But it's like he stays where he's at two more days and lets the thing die. And the thing dies and the thing withers and they're going to be thrown into the dark night of what do you do when there's not the immediate breakthrough. And I think many of you have walked and are walking through seasons like that to where you, you have history with God. You know him. You've seen him break through in many ways and in many places, many times in your life, but yet you've hit a season in your life to where it's some things have died and there's been loss. 
and you don't know how to deal with these seasons. They're hard. And I think Jesus is throwing his friends into the dark night to awaken a certain, to wake, I'm going to say it this way, to awaken a new prayer for a new season. All right? Everybody say four days. That's how long Jesus was late to Bethany. By the time he got to Bethany, Lazarus has been in the tomb for four days. It's going to throw, throw Mary and Martha into a whirlwind. And it says that as soon as Jesus got to the edge of Bethany, it says as soon as, it says that Mary was sitting in the house, and as soon as Martha heard that Jesus was here, he took off running and he ran out to the edge of Bethany, and he met Jesus face to face. And I think in these kinds of seasons, there's two different responses. One is not a good response, and the other one is the one I think he's looking for. And he loves to teach us new tricks if we're really bad and like more like the first person. See, Martha was one who was addicted to the swirl. Martha lived in the whirlwind, of busyness, worry, anxiety, and troubled. And she didn't learn how to sit at Jesus' feet in Luke 10. So here she is in a real crisis, and all she has is anxiety. All she has is fix-it mode. And she's going to run out to Jesus, and she said, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. If you'd have gotten here on time, we wouldn't be in this mess. So she says the right phrase, but then she's going to kick in to what I call Christianese. It's like the B organ gets going. We get Jason over here on the, on the organ, starts hitting the B organ. She goes, but even now, I know that whatever you ask God, God will give you. <laughs> Sounds awesome, don't it? <laughs> Jesus, stone cold, Steve, just looks it right in the face. Your brother's going to rise again. Turn the B organ back on. <laughs> I know. Hey. I know he's going to rise at the resurrection at the last day. Good theology. Don't move Jesus. Good, good answers aren't what move Jesus. You looking to do these seasons in all the nice way. How you doing, sister? I know you're going through hell. It's awesome. We're doing great. <laughs> Praise the Lord. He's faithful. And we just masquerade, putting lipstick on a pig, just covering up everything with Christianese and hallelujahs. And God's not looking for a right answer. He's looking for you to get cut from the moment, to actually get thrown into the tension of mystery of I don't know. And when someone tells you they know, they don't know. He goes, I know that he's going to rise again at the resurrection at the last day. That's good theology. She, he looks her right in the face, and he goes, Honey, I am the resurrection and the life. It's not coming someday. It's coming today. And I'm looking for you to get out of your Christianese and actually let the moment cut you, and you pull me into the story. Jesus loves ugly praying. Jesus loves mascara rolling, hair shaking, a little bit of cussing, and a deep guttural cry. Y'all know I'm joking about that. They look, oh my God, did you say that? Oh my God. And to the level that hits you might be the person I'm talking to. <laughs> I'll let that stick where it needs to stick. I am the resurrection and the life. It's me. He goes, do you believe this? She goes, yes, Lord. I believe that you're the Christ, the Son of God. So Martha hits a wall called, we're talking on two different frequencies. I say this, he says this. I say this, I say this. We had a good theological discussion, but nothing changed. Some of you are looking to have all the right answers and he's looking for the right posture to touch your heart and a new depth of humility, a new depth of desperation. 
and something deeper to break on the inside of you. She's going to run back into the city and grab Mary and say, the teacher's come and he's calling for you. I love that. I don't see Jesus ask for Mary. I think Martha looked at him and said, I'm past my pay grade here. man. I, I need some help. Mary runs to the exact same place as Martha, about verse 31, falls down at his feet. Everybody say at his feet. At his feet. Okay. Falls down at his feet. Every time you see Mary, she's at his feet. Falls down at his feet, and with tears in her eyes, she's going to pray the exact same prayer as Martha. But she's going to pray it from a different place. See, it's not about the right words. It's not about the right puzzle pieces to unlock your season. It ain't about finding the exact thing to say to unlock it. It's a level of brokenness. And real faith is not just a certainty. It's not hyper-optimism and it's not hyper-pessimism. It's mystery of I know who you are. I know who you are, but I don't understand. I don't understand. And I'm going to live in the tension until you prove yourself and show yourself for who I know you to be. With tears in her eyes, she says it. Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who were with her weeping, the Bible says that he groaned in the spirit. What did John see to write down? He groaned. An audible noise came out of Jesus. Something came out of his bowels of compassion. Something came out of the depths of his being, and he released an audible groan. Something was stirred in resurrection. Something was stirred in resurrection, and then he asked, where have you laid him? And they said, come and see. And then we see the longest verse in the Bible. In front of strangers... Sinners, Pharisees, disciples, he wept. I mean, usually who gets to see ugly crying from you? Usually one person, maybe two if you're wild. (laughs) Who gets to see the ugly stuff from you? Jesus, this is what blows me away. Why didn't Jesus, he knew what he was going to do from the beginning. Why didn't he translate to the resurrection of Lazarus then? He's going to get glory. It's not going to end in death. He said this is not unto death. He didn't say he wouldn't die. He he just said it's not going to end in death. Why didn't Jesus translate to the resurrection? So many of us want to fast forward our story just to get to breakthrough season, and yet there's a revelation of God in the loss, in the death, in the pain, in the mystery, that, that's where he's found. That's why he showed up with his friends in the valley of weeping, wept with them, exposed his vulnerable heart, and had a storm come out of him to unite, to sympathize, to join, and then to come out of the valley of weeping into the season of resurrection. I want every one of you to know, whatever your story is, there's a thousand stories, and either you've run to the golf course, you've run to women, other women, you've run to other substances, you've run to other stuff to anesthetize and medicate the pain. Others have ran to religion to get busier at church. Others have gotten busier at work to medicate, to medicate the pain. And yet God's saying, will you open up these vulnerable areas of your heart and get real with me? I want to burst something in you. Because from that place, after he weeps, he then comes out of it. And it says that he's still groaning in the spirit. And then he's going to tell Martha and the crew around there, he goes, hey, move the stone away. Let me tell you, tears are the seedbed for resurrection. Tears are the seedbed for resurrection. 
He says, roll away the stone. Martha, with her big faith-filled stuff earlier, goes, Jesus, let's get practical. He stinks. I know I had big statements 10 verses ago, but I was just saying that to look good in front of the crew. I actually don't believe you. He goes, didn't I tell you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? And then he raised his eyes to heaven. He goes, Father, I thank you that you hear me. You always hear me. And then he turned and he, he spoke to a cave. And he said, Lazarus, come forth. And a man who had been dead for four days, wrapped in linen cloths, comes walking out of a grave. I believe there are Lazaruses that are in this house. And God always loves to use. I was preaching this in Little Rock a couple days ago. But this is a message. God uses personal stories to birth generational transitions. And he'll use your story. And if you'll let the moment cut you, it'll produce a prayer. It'll produce a cry. I talked about Hannah. How Hannah was barren for years and played hallelujah, it's all good, until the dam began to break on the inside of her. And then a prayer came out of her, and she said, Lord, look on this affliction. Everybody say, look. Most of us are embarrassed. Most of us are humiliated. And I want to say, revival praying is where you don't care anymore. <laughs> Revival praying is I don't care anymore. I don't care how I look. I don't care how about respectable I am. God, I'm bringing you into this. And God, you give me this. I'm not going to hold on to that. I'll give it back to you. It, Revival praying breaks control off of you. She says, you give me a child, I'm not going to walk around with the child saying, look at all you other women. Look what I did. I'm not going to flex with your breakthrough. You're going to give away your breakthrough. I'm not going to use it for your church. We're not going to build an electric fence around it saying, this is my church and where glory is happening. See, so God's got to bring you to a place to where of desperation saying, I don't want to control it, God. I just want to have it. And we need to break the silence in the generation. See, Hannah had a bigger prayer. She said, God, you got the priesthood is in shambles, and there is no prophetic spirit. Eli and his sons were corrupt. And she said, God, we got to have pure priesthood again. we got to have pure worship again. And God, we need your word. We need your voice in the land. And she goes, I ain't going to use it to build... Hannah Ministries. I'm going to use it and give it back to you. God has put it, and I feel like there's a bunch of personal stories where we could become a corporate womb. A bunch of personal stories under becoming a corporate womb to birth a spirit of revival into this region where God would change the statistics. I'm sick of the meth epidemic that is destroying our young people. I am disgusted by the power of sorcery and pharmacia that is destroying our children. And I want to see a move of God. I want to see an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I want to see salvation spring up from the ground. I want to see an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I don't care where he does it. And if he does it in that Presbyterian church down the road, we're all heading down there. If he does it in that Baptist church, we're heading down there. If he does it here, we're coming here. I don't care. Because it ain't about church. It's about kingdom. It's about a birth. We need a move of God. We need a move of God. I believe in moves of God. God restores years. When God steps down, he does in months what removes the scourge of years and decades. 
And I just want to ask that he would begin to cut you tonight and awaken and use and, and let your personal story be the, be the, uh, the vehicle into a new prayer. You pray before dinner and you pray before bed. But have you been laid hold of by a burden? Has anything ever laid a hold of you where you began to cry and you don't know why? See, I believe God's going to impart the gift of tears. I call it liquid prayer. I understand crying because of hard seasons. But I want to make my tears count. Do you know that there's a move of prayer? There's, I call it tears, tongues, and travail. Three T's. Us charismatics and Pentecostals, the thing we're most known for is the thing we do the least of. Pray in tongues. You got a badge, but God wants to rip your badge off your chest. He wants it to begin to activate you at 3 in the morning. When revival praying lays hold of you, you're going to have to give your sleep to Jesus. He will wreck sleep patterns. He will wreck eating habits and eating patterns. He will wreck your niceness. You got to, you, 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 you're like, we need God. I don't want any more tea and strumpets. <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> All right. And there is a travail of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to go into it, but in the same way you get, how many mamas in here giving birth to babies? There's conception, and then you carry for nine months, and as you get into that last stage, you begin to get almost miserable. You start getting just this sense of it's time. In the same way, spiritual moves of God are birthed. God begins to lay hold of you, conceives. And I'm praying that tonight, here we are, May 24, whatever month this is, five or six. What is this, five? That come January, February, something starts popping out. <laughs> What if he wanted to begin to burn in you a vision to see God move in this city, in this region, and see the river valley get filled again? Isaiah 44, he said, I'm going to pour out my spirit like water on the dry ground. He says, Isaiah 44, 3 and 4, it says that your descendants will spring up like willows among the water courses. You need to get those revival prayers on the inside of you. Habakkuk 3, in the midst of wrath, remember mercy. Isaiah 64, oh, that you would rend the heavens and that you would come down. Acts 2, that you would pour out your spirit on all flesh and that sons and daughters would prophesy. Old, young, men, women, every background would be received the Holy Spirit and would prophesy, which means this, that there would be power on the Word of God again. That's what the spirit of prophecy is. I'm grateful for words of knowledge, but the true prophetic spirit is when there's weight on the Bible again. When the Word of God hits you like a lightning and phrases laid hold of you, that's the prophetic spirit. That's what we need. We need a revival in the Bible. We read these promises. They're not suggestions. And you begin to pray these things over your children. I don't want good kids. I, want, I do want good kids, but I want on fire kids. I, I don't want good kids. I want on fire kids. Holy Spirit, we want you to lay hold of us tonight. We want you to lay hold of us with a vision. Again, this is inheritance that we're coming after. 
If you would say when I'm talking about that Mary story and Lazarus' death, you're in that season, that, that season where there's been death, loss, and you feel like the Lord's wanting to awaken something in you tonight. If that's a season you recognize, raise your hand. Yeah. Whew. Now I'm going to do that evangelist thing. Now stand up and come up here. Jason, come up here. Just stand up here and make a line. All over the room, you feel like Mary and Martha in that season. Come on. I'm going to ask the rest of us to stand up. We're going to ask him to lay hold of us tonight. Go ahead and take a, a half step forward. I just want to make room. There. There we go. Good. Everybody just open up your hands. I just want to pray that there would be the breaking. I, I, I'm going to declare Hosea 10, 12 over you. He says, break up. He goes, sow for yourselves righteousness, reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground. For it's time to seek the Lord till he comes and he rains righteousness on you. There's coming a rain of righteousness on this region. Oh, that the river valley would be filled again with the river of God. Ha, ah, that's it. I want you all over the room to begin to pray. Begin to pray. If you have your prayer language, begin to pray. If you don't, just begin to say, Lord, break up my fallow ground. Here we are, Jesus. Jesus, we need you to move in the river valley. Our children are dead. Our marriages are dead. Oh, God, we need you, Lord. We need a move of God in our region. Oh, Lord Jesus, we need you. I declare a breaking of the fallow ground. I declare a breaking of the fallow ground. I declare a breaking of the fallow ground. Break the ground, God. 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 Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. You break in the power of witchcraft. Break in the power of witchcraft. You break in the power of witchcraft. I declare the blood of Jesus over the river valley. I declare the blood of Jesus over the river valley.
I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life, says the Lord. Oh. Oh. Crease your presence, Lord. Crease your presence, Lord. Dana, come up here and sing. Uh. I'm going to ask everybody in the room to begin to pray. You're up. We're going to ask God to enlarge our capacity. Increase your presence. Oh. We're just lingering in the presence tonight. Just prophesy over us, Dana. Put your eyes on Jesus wherever those dead areas are. Say, God, awaken a new prayer for a new season. New prayers for a new season. New prayers for a new season. New prayers for a new season. You are the resurrection. Oh, oh, Rabasa. Everybody lift your hands. We're going to ask him right now, Father, pour out your spirit. I pray for the birth of the spirit of prayer. Hey, come on. Lift your voice. Come on. Spirit of revival. Spirit of revival. Feel the rain of your love. Feel the wind of your spirit. Now the heartbeat of heaven. Let us hear. I feel the wave of your love. I feel the wind of your spirit. Now the heartbeat of heaven, let us hear. 
you right now in the river valley that you would let it rain we want the rain of your spirit oh lord we want you to come and tenderize us
Lord, we say we believe it again. We say we're reaching again. And I still believe. Come on. Here in this waiting, I believe, I believe. And I still believe that you will come, God. Because you are not a man that you should lie, no. Yes, and I yes. Say, all of your promises are yes, yes. and amen. I say I believe it again today, God. You are not a man that you should lie, no. Say we believe it again, God, as we cry out. Round the heavens, round the heavens, round the heavens, and come down, and come down. the prayer in our schools come down come down we say come down everybody let's sing this together come down say come down we say come down cry come down lord come down come down just like you promised we say come down your spirit, Lord.
Rabakaye. few more minutes here. Just open up your hands again. We're just waiting on the Lord. I want your prayers. I want your your cries to come before the throne right now. Let's just just lift up your prayers right now before the Lord. Oh, we love you so much, Jesus. I ask you I ask you for a well. I ask you for the well. The well. I ask you for the well. Unclog the well of the river valley. Unclog the well of the river valley. Release a worship and evangelism anointing. Worship and evangelism, oh God. Worship and evangelism, oh God.
tried to take you out over and over again I say but God but God shows up every time over and over again let's say this day what the enemy meant for evil he's gonna turn it all around turn it all around what the enemy for evil it's gonna turn it all around turn it all around what the enemy meant for evil he's gonna turn it all around turn it all around what the enemy meant for evil he's gonna turn it all around turn it all around he's gonna turn it the goodness of God 
in the land of the living today in the land of the living It's just the beginning. 